Welcome to the More Perfect Union, the podcast that offers real debate without the hate. I'm Kevin Kelton here along with Greg Matusak. Kevin, it's so good to it's it's been a while since we've been on the same podcast. People were starting to talk. I don't know if they were saying it was a feud between us or that we're actually the same person, just different voices, but no one has seen us on the same podcast in at least a month, I think. Has it I been know. longer? I'd forgotten how lovely you are. I know. I'm glad we could quelch all these rumors that there's like (laughs) beef or that we're the same person. I don't care. But either way, it is great to see you. You look good, too. Thank you. Thank you. Joe Syart is here, a.k.a. Producer Joe. Hi, Joe. How's it going, Kevin? I'm glad that this week part of my student loan has been forgiven. Now, if I can get some of my student dating record forgiven, <laughs> there some questionable choices then. Oh, I could use $10,000 worth of that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Also joining tonight is a return champion, AJ Strangebrew. Hey, AJ. What Joe really wants forgiven is his grades that he got while he was a student. That's what he really needs forgiven. But guys, thank you. <laughs> very much for having me on here. Love the show and it's nice to meet you, Kevin. Yeah, same here. I really enjoyed you on the episode that I wasn't able to join in person. And we have a lot of woohooing to do tonight because this is our 350th episode. That's a lot of podcasts, guys. Congratulations to everybody. It's going to be the official end of our seventh season. We've been doing this since uh, our first episode, Greg. Do you remember the date? It was in September because there's a Earth, Wind, and Fire song that I always think <laughs> about you because of this, but I don't know the exact date. It was September 22nd, 2015. Wow! I think my beard was not even gray back then. You had just reached puberty, and we were talking that first show about the second Republican debate in the primaries of 2015 leading into 2016. The funny thing about that is I remember we were all sat there going, Trump doesn't have a chance. This is a joke. <laughs> Actually, I went back and listened to part of the first podcast this week in anticipation of this show. Is it on vinyl? It's it's on (laughs) vinyl. You know, I was hoping I'd find like a great clip, but there was nothing that jumped out at me that was worth going through all that effort. But I will say, (laughs) you're not going to believe me, but on that first episode, I was the only one who thought Trump had a chance of getting the nomination. You have told me this story before. and It's not like I said, oh, it's definite. It was kind of like, well, you know, if he does well in New Hampshire and things go okay in Iowa, who knows, you know. We had, if, if I remember, I think we had, did we have six people on that podcast? No, no, no. The first original podcast was Alan, you, Jonah, and me. Okay. We were the first four on the show. And then let's see, I'm going to throw some shout outs here to actually thank the people who made us and 350 episodes possible. We want to shout out to Alan, Jonah, DJ, Cliff, Emily, Molly, Helena, Rebecca, Ward, Lily, Sue Kalinsky, Robin Rosenfeld, who did a few episodes each, Jennifer Peterson, who's joined us a couple of times, Linda Nori, who's joined us a few times, Ken and Heppy, AJ, of course, you, and Joe, you started, do you know what number you started at? Because I do. I'm going to say 343. Much earlier, 331. Oh, three, oh three, wow. Yeah, I was going to say 332. Yeah, but, yeah, 331. And we want to also thank the dozens of other guests who've shared our mic along the way. Also, I want to take a moment to do something that I really should do almost every week. A big shout out to the Keenies, Sally, who is our biggest fan, Without and Alan Keeney, who composed and played our theme song and lets us use it every week. So I want to thank you guys for your loyalty to the show as well. Guys, the thing that drew me to your show and what I love about it is when Joe told me about it, it's the fact that you guys really do have real debates without the hate. It's not just a tagline. It is what you guys do. And I absolutely love that premise of the show. And I think it has added a lot of longevity to your podcast. Yeah. I mean, we really wish that we could have found, We, like I said, we had some more conservative voices who, you know, anything that runs seven years. Cast are going to change. People are going to move on, right? We've wanted to find someone who could fill that lane, but still have our sensibility and our sense of humor much tougher than one would think. So if anybody's out there and you think you have that conservative attitude and that conservative uh, view... Let us know, and uh, who knows, we'll check you out, and maybe someday you'll be sitting here celebrating episode 400 with us. Let's get on, because this week, the announcement of that student debt forgiveness came up, and that was huge, I thought. Yeah, I think it's a huge, huge accomplishment. You know, originally, I wasn't so sure about it, but the more I read about 
what's in this particular proposal. It's not a bill. It's some type of executive order, I guess. The more I like it. What about you guys? Personally, I think it's a good idea. I think that there's a lot of people that get themselves at a very young age straddled with a lot of debt without truly understanding the concept behind a loan, understanding truly what goes into it. Because not everybody has the base at home to give them that understanding. So now 10 years later, you finish school and you're still trying to pay off hundreds of thousand dollars worth of loans without actually having that concept when you signed it. Yeah, I graduated school many, many, many years ago, and I was twenty five thousand in debt, I think. And I remember the day I signed those papers, my parents said, do you want to go to college? I said, yeah. They said, then sign these papers. And no one sat down and said, look, this is what you are going to owe when we're finished. And I'm not complaining. My parents, I'm not mad at my parents for doing it. It worked out really well. But the other side of that is the price of an education back then was fractional of what it is today. This is a good bill all around. And Anytime I hear someone say, well, I paid mine off. How come I don't get something out of this? I lose patience with them. One, because this is going to help everybody. The money will be reinvested. It's not trickle down economics at this point. We're not giving it to a big company and hoping they'll give raises to people. This goes straight into the pockets of people who will hopefully buy things, you know, reinvest their wealth into things like food, clothing, cars. Yeah, this is, this is a dollar for dollar kind of proposal where every dollar that stays in the pocket of a consumer is going to be paid out. It's not like we're only going to get 60 cents on the dollar or 70 cents on the dollar. It's all going back into the economy because the people who are going to get this loan forgiveness are people who are living below their income to begin with. Here's the other thing that you can say to that person who says, I pay back mine. It's not about you. It is about everybody in the greater good of society. Believe it or not, no matter what your Facebook and Instagram says, it's not about you. For those people that that say, oh, this is only going to a select few people. Well, first of all, all government policy is targeted. Anytime they put a tax break in legislation, it's targeted. Anytime there's affirmative action, it's targeted. And for the better of society. So are religious tax exceptions for churches, synagogues, and mosques. But no one whines that they are unfair to atheists and cults. And another thing I want to point out is everybody says, well, you know, the people who took out these loans... They knew what they were getting into. They signed the paperwork. You know what? They didn't know that there was going to be a two-year pandemic with lockdowns that were going to lock a lot of college graduates out of the workforce for a year and a half. So, you know, we 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 had PPP loans for people who were already in the workforce and PPP loans for businesses so that they could stay afloat during that year, year and a half. This is going back and saying, well, These people who couldn't get into the workforce because there were no companies that were open to hire them, these people started the race $10,000 behind because those debts did not go away when they had no income for a year and a half. And I have a son who graduated just at the beginning of the pandemic, and I know him and his friends all went through that same hardship. And not only that, but then you get the jerks that are like, yeah, but what about unemployment? They had unemployment during that time period. Not if you didn't have a job. Exactly. (laughs) How do you get unemployment if you've never put anything into it? There was no job. Yeah, well, they should just go back and live with their parents. You know, it's like, well, my kid has a job now. It's about a 95 minute drive from where his mother lives. So he can't drive home every night because it's it's a job that makes him work well into the night. So it's that's not possible. The cost of renting apartments Now, I don't know about where you guys live, but I know anecdotally through my son that the cost of trying to get an apartment in Los Angeles or Santa Barbara, that will eat up your entire paycheck. It's unbelievable. The apartments that I lived in before I live where I do now, we looked back at the prices because we're just interested to see where it's at. For the same exact apartment that we left two years ago is now $1,000 more than it was when we were living there. Yeah. That's absolutely Mm -hmm. incredible. Yep. Here's some happy news. The DOJ released that affidavit that the Trump people wanted released that was going to prove to the world that they have been wronged and Trump has been violated. And everybody knew it was going to be heavily redacted. It came out. It was heavily redacted. And now they're crying that that's the cover up. So what are you going to do? The best part of that is the reason it was heavily redacted, according to the FBI and the Department of Justice, excuse me, was because it was to protect, and this is my favorite word, a significant 
number of witnesses. And up until this point, the Trump campaign has been thinking there's been a single mole, one person against him. Was it Melania? Was it Jared? Was it you know, someone. But what it actually sounds like and what they've implied is everyone's out to get him. <laughs> Everyone, <laughs> there could be dozens of people, everyone from the pool boy to, you know, his side piece, everybody. Has secret service agents? Secret service agents. But that's a whole nother story. You know, it could be just devastating. Thanks to how redacted it was, we got more information out of paperwork from Roswell and from the <laughs> than we did in this paper it was absolutely yeah. insane i think yeah. we got like three sentences they're but, out to get you know i mean i'm sure that other people have thought of this i'm sure this isn't the most original thought but if he indeed had human in, what do they call it human intelligence he had the names or identifying information on human assets in other words agents that are planted in various countries okay there is no reason in the world that any president should be taken that home at night. That's not reading material. That's not something that you study and go, hmm, I wonder why, you know, Kevin Kelton is stationed in Syria. Maybe we should move him over to Africa. That's not what you do when you have this kind of information. So it's clear to every thinking person that he was going to use this information for nefarious reasons. Yeah, and I think to add to your point, it's known and it's well known that Donald Trump doesn't read. Yeah. And I'm not being I'm not being a dick when I say that. It's documented. He didn't it's read documented. security stuff in the Oval Office. Why would he be reading it in the bedroom at night? Right. They literally had to make lots of pictures, bullet points, big, big, big details. I he mean, had somebody come in to read his books on tape for him. That's how little he reads. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, if, if he could get his security notes done in a highlights magazine, he would. But the point is, Kevin said, nefarious reasons. And this really comes down to two reasons. Okay. Yeah, I think two. One, the obvious is he'd sell it. Okay. And whether that has to do with the $2 billion Jared Kushner just got from the Saudis, or he would sell it piecemeal, I don't know. But the other one, and this is the one I always find interested, is that he's always planned to keep it as a get out of jail free. Yes. Right. Lindsey Graham just said this tonight about 20 minutes ago, I think. He said, if Trump is arrested, there will be riots in the street. And whether he was threatening violence or whether he was just saying like typical Lindsey Graham nonsense, he's, you know, that's a call to arms. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's been a lot of calls to arms. I, yeah. I, I think that it's a, a fever that we have to burn out of this country. They're going to be threatening forever. If you do this, they'll be rioting in the streets. If you do this, it'll be a civil war. I think it's better to nip that, that sucker in the bud. You know, I think the biggest mistake that Republicans made was not cutting the ties with him the week of the second impeachment. I can't wrap my head around what Mitch McConnell had to be thinking not to let his senators vote to impeach. That had to be the single worst political move in the history of politics. Caesar trusting Brutus, a close second. Well, it also showed how little stones he actually had. That's uh, if he wanted what was best for the country, what was best for his po for his political party. They should have just voted to impeach him and just called it a day. Yes, so he obviously has no no guts whatsoever. Yeah, yeah, and, and they think that they could ride this two headed monster and tame him, and and get the benefit of his popularity. His people would have moved on. His loyalists. What were they going to do? Become libertarians? And we're going to talk about libertarians in a few moments. <laughs> what were they going to do? Become disaffected Democrats or not vote anymore? They would have said, his, okay, I guess Marco Rubio is my guy now. Okay, I guess Ron DeSantis is the man. They would not have left the Republican Party. They had no place else to go. They would have jumped in that DeSantis bandwagon so fast, their head would have spun around. Yep. They're looking for someone to follow. Yep. Yeah. Yep. You know, one of the one of the best pieces of advice my father ever gave me on child rearing. And in fact, when I say one of it's, I think, one of three, but one of the best advices, he said, never reward bad behavior. OK. And whether you're dealing with a child, whether you're dealing with a dog or a puppy or whether you're dealing with a former president. And that's exactly what we'll be doing is, you know, oh, oh, you're, you're, you're going to throw a tantrum. Well, we better give you what you want. And half the country doesn't see it but 
it's not and and this is where it's not their fault when many media and news outlets including his, uh, Trump's own truth social is spinning this as the government's out to get him which I don't know where they were when uh, Senator Clinton was <laughs> in her emails, but, you know, memory loss, I guess. Yeah, they didn't give a shit when Huma Aberdeen's laptop was taken by the FBI. That wasn't an invasion of privacy. That wasn't a, a constitutional crisis. They didn't care when John Podesta's emails were released to the public a few weeks before a presidential election. That was absolutely fine with them. Nobody cared about his privacy. I think we've all been around long enough to know that when it comes to politics, hypocrisy is where we live at. And unfortunately, we don't necessarily go by what we believe in, but what fits us in the moment. Yep. And we're going to come back to this because I'm going to tie this into one of the television shows we're going to talk about later. Lastly, on the political front, I wanted to touch on the Libertarian Party in New Hampshire. Now, I just learned about this earlier today. And this is a wild story. Greg, I don't know how familiar you are with this, but apparently there is a small but growing libertarian sect in New Hampshire. And they're not like the libertarians that we used to call libertarians. They're not your father's libertarians. These are really QAnon nuts who've decided to form their own party and call themselves libertarians. And they came out. One of the things they did was they're mocking John McCain's death with ads and and um, memes and tweets that are dancing on the anniversary of John McCain's death. Um, yeah. Of course, the McCain family got upset about that and spoke to it, and they just think it's the funniest thing in the world. They initially uh, tweeted out a picture of Megan McCain crying at John McCain's funeral. and it's, at, uh, at his uh, gravesite, yes. At his gravesite. And the caption was, Happy anniversary. And I was like, wait, what? Are, is this a joke? And if it is, it's terrible. And then when they were called out, as if any normal human being was called out for bad behavior or being repulsive or being terrible, you would say like, okay, maybe that was too far. That was terrible. But instead they doubled down and they kept making more jokes or they kept saying, you know, McCain was a terrible person. We should laugh at his death. Um, they justified it. One of their justifications was... When Megan had this photo taken, it's her memorializing and remembering her father at his grave site at the the headstone. You know how people bring flowers and stuff and they put them on headstones, right? Well, she there were flowers there, but one of the things she also brought was she just had a book published and she had laid that at her father's gravestone. You know, dad, look what I've done, whatever it is that she was thinking when she did that. And they said, well, if she was promoting her book in that photo, then everything's open season. She made herself a target. She made him a target because she was turning it into some kind of commercial endeavor. She laid the book at the man's headstone. And their big thing is, is that, oh, he does. He deserves this because he was a warmonger. Anybody who's a warmonger should not be celebrated. So apparently we are no longer to celebrate any veteran hero. Because they're warmongers. That's right. thickening. Yeah, the, the God Bless the Troops Party now wants to hold a dance party on all of their graves. <laughs> okay, with that, uh, because we have run long and we uh, we always love to get to the fun, fun stuff, let's talk about the shows we've been watching on television or if there's a movie you guys want to talk about. I'm going to throw it open to anyone who wants to bring one up and we'll go from there. I want to ask how you guys found the rehearsal because I saw you guys brought it up and I watched episode one this morning and I did not go to work till I watched the last episode and I was utterly fascinated by this show. I wasn't familiar with the guy at all and this show really unfolds. So how did you guys discover him and what do you think of the show? And then I want to get into a couple moments in the show that I was just flabbergasted by. I, I haven't watched all of it. I've seen I've seen a, a couple episodes. Um, just just a- for the audience, just so they know what we're talking about. This is a new show on HBO called The Rehearsal, and it is presented as a a form of reality television where a guy named Nathan um, Fieldler Fieldler, thank you, takes people who have problems and helps them solve their problems by rehearsing and rehearsing 
different possibilities until they feel fully comfortable addressing the problem in the real world. Does that sound like a good description? Yeah. And a lot of this sprang up from Nathan's real social anxiety issues that he has in real life, which he states in the first episode that he is an awkward person. If you've seen his other shows, the one that was on Comedy Central, I believe, uh, Nathan for you. Yes, that's what I was told. It's it's he's he's he played he definitely played a character in that one where he was a uh, recent business student graduate business graduate who was trying to help struggling businesses. This one, he's supposedly playing himself trying to help these people. It's not your traditional someone tells a joke, someone goes wah wah or a laugh track. Um, it's not situational comedy in any stretch of the imagination. And it's a lot of it is based either on absurdity or awkwardness. It's an it uncomfortable remi- show for some people to watch. It's a very uncomfortable show for, for some people. It reminds me of the band They Might Be Giants, okay. if anyone uh, remembers I'm, them. I'm going to jump but, in here. I want to hear from AJ. AJ, oh, have okay, you seen I'm the sorry. show? I, I have. And even like the first episode where he helps out the trivia master who's trying to deal with the fact that he's been holding back a lie from his teammates and friends. It, it just, it goes through so many different interesting twists and turns. It, it's hard not to watch. Okay. Now I'm going to cut in here. Let's get, let's, let's jump to the chase. And I should warn people that there may be some spoilers here. If you haven't seen the series yet, uh, not spoilers about storyline, but, but bigger spoilers than that. Uh, some people have described this as a reality show. Uh, would anybody here um, uh, agree with that description, or how would you describe the series? I would reality almost co- satire. Yeah, it's almost like a pseudo documentary more than a reality. Yeah. Show. What do you think, Joe? I was told it was a comedy at work, and I was like, "There's no way that is a comedy. It is an interesting study in people." I don't want to call it reality TV because I hate reality TV and I love this show. Like, okay, like AJ said, and I hate to spoil the end of the first episode, but he helps this guy through this lie and he himself confesses a lie to this guy. And this guy gets so mad at it. And you would think through everything he's gone through, worried about that reaction, that's his initial reaction. So that had me hooked. And then you got the lady he tries to raise the baby with, who is a nut. She was one of my favorite characters because she's just so off the wall. Okay, I've thrown out the bait and you guys have taken it. Okay, Greg, before I got into podcasting, what did I do? You wrote TV shows. I did scripted television shows my entire adult life. Gentlemen, spoiler alert. This show is scripted top to freaking bottom. There is no reality in this series. Really? That's kind of why I went with reality satire, because it's obviously written, but it's a satire showing what people's reality could be. Yes, that is correct. It is a, a put on. It is the Andy Kaufman of sitcoms. I explained it like that. He seems almost like a next level Andy Kaufman. That is a great reference, by the way, Andy Kaufman. And and we'll we'll take that a little bit further. But, you know, sometimes you go to see a magic show and you're with a group of people and there's one or two people in your group who say, how did he make that woman disappear? That That's just amazing. And you go. Well, you know, it's a trick. I mean, there's there's a trick. And you go, no, no, that couldn't have been a trick. I saw him. I, I saw him cut her in half. He cut her in half. How did he put it back? And at a certain point, you have to kind of metaphorically shake them and go, it ain't real. It didn't happen. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to pull the curtain aside right now. I'm going to walk you guys through this. Joe, first episode, where did it take place? It took place... What was it in a bar and then in a fake bar? In what city? I don't even remember. I'm sorry. Somebody's got to know the answer. It's New York City. Yeah. New York City is where the character Core lived. And Nathan went to visit him in his apartment in New York City. And the storyline eventually took them to a bar in Brooklyn called the Alligator Lounge, which is a real bar in Brooklyn, right? And this entire episode took place in three or four locations, there was 
Coors apartment in New York City. There was the Alligator Lounge in Brooklyn. And then there was this warehouse that Nathan explained to us. He had rented and built an exact duplicate replica of the entire Alligator Lounge. So they had a place to work out this encounter that Core uh, was going on to rehearse it over and over until he was ready to do it in real life, right? Then there was also yeah. some scenes in upstate New York, some scenes with them walking around the city. That was the first episode, right? Right. Yep. The rest of it was in uh, Oregon, if you recall, right? Yep. Guys, I have read, and I know this for a fact, the entire series was shot in Oregon. Not just five of the six episodes. The entire series was shot in Oregon. Nothing except those exterior shots of the Alligator Lounge, which is B-roll. Nothing was shot in New York. Oh, wow. That, that is one hell of a soundstage. <laughs> well, think <laughs> about it. What they did, AJ, is they replicated the bar, but they did it in Oregon. And that was the set where when we saw it and we thought, well, now they were in the real alligator lounge. This is the real scene now playing out. That was inside the set. And here's how I know that. This is from a magazine that is called the Cinemaholic. It is an industry magazine. And this is part of an article that they had on the production of the rehearsal. The rehearsal is filmed entirely across the state of Oregon, although the narrative of the Nathan Fielder starer is set in New York City. The cast and crew managed to recreate the locales of the Big Apple in Oregon. It is relatively easy as many portions of the series involve the characters utilizing interior sets to rehearse and prepare for their upcoming situations. Now, allow us to give you a detailed account of the specific locations that appear in the comedy show. Then it states, Oregon is used to double for New York City. So that proves that the entire premise of it being a reality show was indeed bullshit. It's all scripted. So they gave you the trick before they even pulled it. Let me ask you guys a question. Yeah. For those of you who enjoyed it, uh, (laughs) By the way, me. I think it was fucking brilliant. Excuse my friend. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love this show, right, but I love right. it as a comedy show. All right. Wait, 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 though. Wait, wait. For those of you who enjoyed it, who thought that it was real, does it change your reaction or feelings towards it now that you know, because Kevin told us so, and he's rarely lied to me, um, <laughs> that it's fake, that and it was I, scripted? I, it, well, I'll let, uh, I'll let Joe answer that first. I... I want to go back and watch it, but now I've got big questions because there was a couple scenes in there that if it's not real, why would you write it that way? And it's mainly the things to deal with that lady's views on Judaism. They wrote it the because they the created show. a character who was an anti-Semite. That was the humor. That was the joke. And he's in a fact- Jewish man trying to co-parent with a woman who is an anti-Semite. In it fairness, makes sense sure. with her favorite movies being Mel Gibson. I'm like, that's of course. a you on the nose. Of course. Let me make another point. I could go through, by the way, I knew it was fake before I knew this, this trivial fact about where it was shot. Because I know how television shows are put together. For instance, I'm going to cite two things from the series. In the first episode, no, I'm sorry, in the second episode, when he starts co-parenting with this woman, and the setup is that she wants to see what it's like to raise a child. Nathan is going to hire child actors, starting with babies and gradually bringing them up to 18 years old. And they're going to simulate what it's like for this woman to be a single mother. Okay, that's the premise. And they explain that they had to have like four babies at a time because, you know, children can only walk work up to four hours per shift on a television show, and then four six-year-olds, and then four 12-year-olds, and then four 18-year-olds. And they also explained that because of child labor laws, that you cannot use young children on a shooting set, film or television, after a certain time at night. So to simulate the experience of her having a child crying and waking her up in the middle of the night, 
They had a dummy in the in the uh, cradle, and they were going to pipe in the sounds of baby crying. Do you remember that, Joe? Yeah. Okay. Yep. So okay, and to do that, Nathan hired a guy who he said we found him on Craigslist, and he described himself as a night owl to us, and he was going to run the the recordings at pre set times to wake her up with the crying, right? Yeah. And the joke was, but for the first couple of nights, this guy fell asleep 15 minutes after a shift started. And so it wasn't working. And then Nathan had to stay up with him ostensibly for the next couple of weeks because this guy would fall asleep if he was left to his own devices, right? The night yeah. out. You'd fire that guy. First of all, you wouldn't hire him. You'd, you'd get a young college intern because this guy looked like a junkie. Okay. You'd fire that guy the first night. They show him in the, he's still on the, on the crew for yeah, the rest seems- of the shoot. <laughs> you'd fire him immediately, right? You wouldn't keep him around to, to just hang out with Nathan at night. Another thing is uh, on episode five or six, I think it was episode five. They threw a birthday party. For one of the kids. Okay. And Nathan has this elaborate uh, simulated birthday party planned for this kid. And they're going to use extras as his friends, child actor extras and adults as their ostensible parents. Right. Yeah. And so you see them sending these people. Here's a present. His name is such and such. And you're his best friend. Go to the party. Next car comes. Here's your present. Remember his name is such and such. Go have fun at the party. And then you cut to the party and no one's speaking. They're all miming conversations. And in the the voiceover, he says, I forgot until we got on the set that if actors have speaking parts, you have to pay them a lot more. So we couldn't have anybody speaking at the party. Okay. He he forgot that until they were in the scene shooting. Okay. Guys, have you ever heard of something called a unit production manager? I have not. I there, have to, yeah, I have. there was an entire crew, and you can go to IMBD and look this up, internetmoviedatabase.com. They had an entire crew, including unit production managers, who are the physical producers of television shows. They don't forget this stuff until the day of shoot. They'd go immediately, you know, you, we have to hire all of these actors. And if they're going to be speaking, you have to pay them. You don't forget that until the day you're on the set. That's a joke. Everything oh, that wow. went wrong in this series was a joke that Nathan Fielder, in his brilliant mind, came up with. Now, do they have the type of scripts that I wrote when I worked on shows that is a screenplay style shooting script with every line of dialogue detailed bit by bit, or is it more of a uh, Larry David curb your enthusiasm detailed outline that has some dialogue in the outline that I can't tell you, but I can promise you every scene in that series was pre-planned. Some of the dialogue might've been ad libbed on the set. Well, they do that in movies too. It doesn't mean they make it up all the time. Okay. And there was no reality in this series. The other thing to think about is why would HBO create a reality series? And by the way, they don't, they don't describe it as a reality series. They may say, uh, the reality of an experiment, but they don't call it a reality series. They call it a comedy series. Why would they create this, this very complex reality setup and not have psychologists? not have child psychologists, not have uh, anthropological experts. They just have this one guy who did a, another show on Comedy Central who's creating the social experiment with no background. <laughs> it's ludicrous. It's very funny. I love it. I can't wait for the second season. But folks, if you're listening, and Joe, I can see that you're still d- dubious about it. But I, take well, it from no, Kevin it makes Kelton. a lot more sense because... When he's like explaining to the kid about like the Christianity and the Jewish thing, that was the scene that I was like, what the hell is going on with this? Like, and I should have realized that it was more set up, but I was think just about plowing the progression. through these episodes. If you think about the progression, and again, I know some of us haven't seen all the episodes, but so the story arc there was this woman, her goal, and she was supposedly the, the focus of this reality story. 
She wanted to simulate what it would be like to raise a child to decide whether she wanted to do this in real life, right? Yeah. She quits the series in episode five with, in a disagreement with Nathan. And he decides that he's going to finish the experiment and he's going to raise this fake child, this simulated child. It makes no freaking sense. It's comedy. Uh, But there's one other thing that I wanted to say. I know I'm going very long on this topic and I apologize, but I'm really passionate about this. As you guys well know, I spend way too much time on Facebook and social media. That's, that's my heroin addiction. Okay. And when I realized that I was being put on and it bugged me that even people in my family were thrown and we like to think of ourselves as a pretty media savvy family and people in my family believed it was a reality show. And I said, okay, I'm going to go find other people on Facebook and I'm going to explain to them what I know. And I found threads where they were talking about the rehearsal on various people's pages. You can't comment on any of them. They closed comments on them after like 5, 10, 15 comments. So if you know what I know, you cannot tell that to anyone. And that's when I realized this guy, Nathan Fielder, is so brilliant. He not only conceived this very funny, very creative television comedy series, he created an entire social media campaign to trick the public into thinking it's a reality show. They created fake accounts or they got people with real accounts to pretend that they were, I know someone who was on the set, blah, blah, blah. I know this guy. He was real. (laughs) It's all BS. And that's why I likened it to Andy Kaufman. So the good news is now that you've actually brought this to us, me and Joe can go back to focusing on something real like the Blair Witch Project. Right. (laughs) I thought it was brilliant. You were going to go for pro wrestling there. (laughs) Hey, Kevin, were you in L.A. a couple of years ago when Nathan Felder did a he did like a publicity stunt where he opened a dumb Starbucks? No, I didn't that? know that. I, I was in L.A., but I didn't know that story. So no. one of one of the things he did, but he didn't take credit for it. A store just popped up one day in L.A. and it was, and the store was called Dumb Starbucks. Okay, and everything inside, like they had Nora Jones CDs, like they sell, but everything said Dumb Nora Jones CDs, and you could get Dumb lattes, and everything had the word Dumb in front of it. And the concept being is that it wasn't really a coffee shop. It was parodying a coffee shop. So Starbucks was like, look, this isn't us. And we don't know how to react to it because we don't know what the laws are about this. But it was an exact, but it came actually in Starbucks cups that then someone then wrote dumb on. Um, yeah, yeah. And it turned out it was him after he closed it down after like a couple of weeks because the joke was. People thought this was a real thing. And because I'm sure Starbucks threatened to sue his ass to oblivion. Probably, probably. Starbucks, although has a usually good sense of humor, but it was so absurd. His whole point was, this is obviously fake. No one Mm -hmm. has a shop called Dumb Starbucks. Um, And he eventually later on said, look, this is me. I definitely did this. This was a joke. Um, And yeah, it's along those same lines. It's there's okay. always a trick. Yeah. And then I'm going to I'm going to put a bow on this and then we'll move on to other television shows because again I know I'm monopolizing the the air with this but it's really important to me. I have come to a startling conclusion about what's happening in this country. We on this show and everyone has been talking for the last 5 6 7 years about how can these Trump people believe what they believe? How can they believe that the election was rigged when it was the Republicans who were in power, right? And a Republican Supreme Court, Republican judges who ruled against Trump, right? right. Uh, and they believe Pizzagate and they believe Trump is a great president and he loves his country. And we're all arguing with them all the time, right? I believe that and that, that Donald Trump is the Andy Kaufman of American politics and all these people, they're in on the freaking joke. I now believe this. I don't believe that these senators who went to better colleges than I did, okay? I don't believe that Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz and Mitch McConnell and, and, uh, um, what's the, the, uh, Lindsey Graham and any of these people really believe what they're saying. They say it one, because they like to make liberals heads explode, 
explode. That's owning the libs. And that's what they live for more than anything else. They want to own the libs. And two, because there are enough Americans in this country who don't have a, a decent enough education and a decent enough sophistication that they believe this crap. Okay. And that's how they're maintaining power. So I believe that there's a tie in to what Nathan is doing in his series and showing us that media can manipulate us to the point where we believe the unbelievable or we argue about it, which still uh, uh, accomplishes their goal. When we're arguing about whether Tucker Carlson believes what he says or not, we're still accomplishing his goal. Some people even believe Andy Kaufman's dead. It's absolutely incredible. (laughs) I love Kaufman, so that's hard to hear, but it makes sense. And maybe that's why I was so into the show, because I got those weird vibes from it. There you go. There you go. Okay, let's talk about other shows. Who wants to talk about something else? Greg, you had a show you wanted to talk about. Oh, it's another reality show. It's called uh, (laughs) She-Hulk. Um (laughs) Um, She Hulk is the uh, newest Marvel. Of course, it's a, of course Greg is watching a superhero show. It's on Disney Plus. Um, and uh, it's the She Hulk character. If you read comic books, has always been kind of a much more lighthearted character. Um, she breaks the fourth wall. Uh, the only other character of the MCU who does that, of course, is Deadpool. Um, and it's mostly the show's been about uh a lot of feminist issues, but also, you know, that juggling that superhero work life balance. Um, it's a lot more fun and lighthearted than let's say moon Knight, which was about mental health, um, and got super dark. Um, and this has been, it's been fun. And, um, the actress, wow. Now, now I'm blanking on names is brilliant. Uh, it's, and anyone who came in to complain about CGI, blah, blah, blah. It's it's fun. It's just as usual, Marvel fun stuff. It's it it it. Not everything has to be highbrow, like the rehearsal or stuff like that. Um, so is kid, the premise of this that it's the Hulk, but it's a woman? Is that the premise? Yeah. Of it? So so the okay. So we'll go back. That's crazy, in, right? There. No. Go in ahead. 1980, <laughs> in 1980, there was a TV show version of the Hulk. Do you remember that? Oh sure. Yeah. Yeah. Lou Ferrigno and Bill Bixby. Oh, God, yes. Right. Well, at the same time, right, there were two other shows around in, in the same demographic called one was the Bionic Man. Bionic Man and Bionic Woman. Sure. Right. So Marvel in 1980 was afraid that the TV makers were going to make a female version of the Hulk. Seeing and seeing as they did that with the Bionic Man, with Lindsay Wagner. Um, so what they did was they said, quick. Let's make a female Hulk, and this way we can own the copyright to it. If the TV people do it, then they would own it. So Marvel then put out a comic, and the comic was originally supposed to be, um, it's a, uh, it's Bruce, it's a, uh, it's the Hulk's cousin. There was an accident, and she becomes a Hulk, um, but she retains the intelligence. She doesn't have the same battles, those internal conflicts of man versus nature. Her conflicts are, I just want to be a lawyer, and I want to help people, and now I'm a six-foot-seven green woman. Um, it's, it's, a, it's always been a good comic. It's always been well well drawn, uh, good storylines, but it's never gotten the same popularity for all sorts of dumb reasons. So, yeah. What I'm hearing is that the Banner family was really irresponsible with their gamma rays. <laughs> <laughs> and that is starring Tatiana Maslany. Yes, exactly. Wow. Good pronunciation. I, I knew I would never get that. Thank you, Joe. I, I can um, barely say Joe Syart. <laughs> she uh she did a show called uh Black Orphan. Um what other show that you guys have on the list? I'm not familiar with this one either. It's called Welcome to Rexham. Did I pronounce that correctly? No, but of course I, not. I, we applaud you for uh <laughs> it's it's uh it's it's awesome you tried. Uh it's Wrexham. Wrexham. Wrexham's a Welsh Welsh uh city, town. Uh have you guys watched it? It's it's got to do with sports. I have not yet. What is this about? Um so Ryan Reynolds and um and Rob McLevoy. McLevaney McLevaney, excuse me, Rob McLevaney. You think I would get this? Um uh Ryan Reynolds, of course, is an international 
movie star. He owns uh, gin companies. He owns uh, mobile phone companies. And Rob McElvaney is that guy from Always Sunny in uh, Philadelphia. Um, they have decided to help and buy a small uh, football team in in um, England, um, a Welsh football team. And, and when you say football, you mean soccer, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. I, I just don't want to get the calls right. from our angry uh, hooligans. Okay, fans. keep going. Okay. Um, it's a soccer, and um, with this, they've said that if they could help the team, they'll be able to help the city. And it's it's meant to be this really how sports teams unite cities. Um, the way their system works over there is, if you are at the bottom of the bracket or your bottom of the season then you get down, put down to a lower level. So, for example, if the Bengals finish dead last this year, right, they may they would have to play like in college ball next year. Okay. And then if they finish dead last in that season, maybe they'd have to play in high school. And seeing as I've suffered through many Cincinnati Bengals, that they might actually do well in high school leagues. But if you finished first, in your league, let's say my local high school team finished first, they would move up a league. Okay. Uh, football doesn't work real well, but baseball, like you could talk about like the pros to the triple a to the farm leagues or whatever, but you can move up or down. And the more you move up, the more money you get and you get more prestige and your city does better. Um, every city has a local team that's somewhere on the scale. Um, so they are now at the bottom, uh, like 30 or 40 years ago, they were at the top. And because of, we'll just say Margaret Thatcher and the eighties and, um, the city has hit on hard times. And they think that if the football team does well, the town will do well. It's a gorgeous, fun documentary so far. God, we're, um, we're blaming a lot of stuff on the eighties tonight. You know, we talked about the Hulk. We talked about Andy Kaufman. We talked about <laughs> Margaret Thatcher. Margaret Thatcher was, and, and I know I'm going to get uh, angry letters from our British people um, who want, listen to the show, but Margaret Thatcher was a terrible human being. And uh, yeah, I'm just say that. Um. Uh, now, wait a minute. I had a poster of her right next to B. Arthur on my wall as a child. She was a lovely human being. <laughs> it explains a lot, including your last name. <laughs> <laughs> AJ, I want to thank you for joining us on what to us is a special episode, not because it's 350, but because we had you back again. Joe Syart, uh, always enjoy your company. And Greg, oh my God, we, uh, not always together, but collectively, we've done 350 of these suckers. Congratulations to you, my friend. Yes, congratulations to you. That's, that, that is something I... I, I know what I'm going to get my new tattoo of. Um. So, guys, the show is yours. I'll be back for episode 700. But until then, uh, we'll be back in another week or two with uh, with a, a episode one, uh, excuse me, 351, I guess. Uh, but we want to thank everybody for listening, not just to this one, but to all the episodes that we've done along the way, seven solid seasons of them. And if you enjoy what we do here, please look for us on iTunes and on Apple Podcasts. And please share our link for the podcast on your Facebook timeline and on Twitter and on TikTok, wherever you might have social media, so that your friends can learn to follow us and love us as well. Hmm. Greg Matusak. What are you going to be doing other than working like a dog for the next week? Because that's all you've been doing all summer. That's all. I've what been are doing. you going to be doing to celebrate I... the pending indictment of Donald Trump? Well, actually, now that you mention this, I'm reassessing all my realities because obviously all TV is fake. So I'm going to go back. I'm going to watch a lot of CNN and say, did that raid actually happen? Was it scripted? And so now all my conspiracy theories are thanks to you, Kevin. And uh, again, you know, I hate to break it to you guys, but Saturday Night Live shot Tuesday mornings. So what? there you go. In Oregon, by the way. Just- <laughs> <laughs>